Hello, we are live right now at Solid Rock Church of God, Dublin. We are a multicultural and a multi-generational church based right here in Dublin, Ireland. And our vision is to be a living, visible demonstration of the kingdom of God. That's right. We want to demonstrate the kingdom of God through love and through sharing the gospel, not only within our community, but beyond it as well. And so we thank you for connecting and we want you please to go ahead and spread this good news so that we can touch as many lives across the world. We believe as you stay connected with us, God certainly has a word that will make a difference in your life. So be blessed and stay tuned. It has defeated death, it has defeated guilt. Cantala patosa, cantale prakoshata, lipatose kete pata. And the church is praying and we are declaring the goodness of the Lord for 2022 years. He has done great things for us. Matanta le prekete patose kete pata. This is a place of victory. We are not sorry that He died. Lift up your voices and declare the things that he has done for you. Mata zakata le prekete pato. Shi kanta kata le prekete paro sata. Shi kanta le pato si kata la pa. Re pato zanta kata le prekete pata. Thank you for giving up your life that we may have life. Para 
trust them in the in the thing that in the place where they thought they had him in the place where they thought that we have we have him now we have defeated him at that very place the bible says that he made a public spectacle of them nailing everything to the cross the cross is our sign of victory the cross is our proof of victory we glorify you oh god thank you for what you have done we are not ashamed of the cross we are not ashamed of the cross because it is the wisdom and the power of god father we thank you we bless you oh god for this wonderful revelation of the cross and the power therein father as we gather here to celebrate we ask oh god that we may truly experience the true magnitude of what you did we are so so grateful we honor you father we thank you holy spirit may you do your work in this service father i want to pray oh god for the worship team as they lead us in worship i pray oh god that you would direct them in the way of the spirit oh god that they would lead us to worship you in truth and in spirit i pray for the one who you have appointed to deliver the word unto us i pray that you may speak through him we honor you father and we lift up our hands in adoration and we say thank you jehovah
Oh, he loves it. You reign, you reign. Cardos. For the blood that you shed, we're grateful. Hey, one more time. You reign, you reign, you reign.
No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no war you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no war you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Sing it. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. He will come after Abandon you. Oh, there's no shadow. No shadow you won't light up. God, man. You won't climb up. What can separate us from the love of Christ? The Bible says nothing. No war you won't kick down. Why you won't tear down. Coming out to me. Oh, there's no shadow. No shadow you won't light up. Nothing you won't climb up. Coming out to me. Jesus, just stay here. Just stay here. Just raise up your hands. Raise up your hands wherever you are. Would raise up your hands. God is so so good. I don't know how many people that God has been so so good to you. I just want us to thank God for Friday. Thank God for this day. Thank God for the cross. When we were wordless, He came and paid the price. It might be just me. It might be just where I'm coming from. I know where the Lord brought me from. If he didn't choose to go on the cross, I wouldn't be here today. And I'm sure all of us here wouldn't be here today. It's because of the power of the cross, his humility, his love for us, that he made that decision to offer himself to die this day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to thank God. Just thank God in your own word. Give him glory. Give him praises. Give him praises. Thank you. Give him glory. Just raise up your hands and give praises to God. Give him honor.
because he's been so, so good to me. Lord brought you from what he's done in your life you breathe your life in me I know where I'm coming from I know where the Lord brought me from you have been I know so, what the cross so did for me yes Jesus oh I spoke a word you were singing over me hallelujah Jesus you have been so, so good to me. Think of his goodness. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Thank you, Jesus. Only you alone, Jesus. You have been so, so kind to me. Yes, Lord. Most gracious Father. You have been so, so good to me. Thank you, Jesus. I just want you to think about that. Think about you his goodness. You have been so, so kind to me. Hallelujah. The one who never leaves you us nor forsakes us. So, so good to me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank him for the cross. Thank him for the you cross. Have been so, so kind to me. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you the glory, Lord. We worship you. Raise up your hands and just give glory. Let the power of God move through you this evening. Let his spirit flow through our lives this evening. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. Thank you for the cross, Jesus. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Maybe some of you deserve it. I didn't deserve it. It's Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just want everybody to thank God. Just thank God for the cross. Just open your mouth and give God praises for the cross. I'm not going to worship God for you. You worship him for yourself. Worship him for the job he did on the cross. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. I give glory to your name Lord. I thank you for my life. I thank you for what you did for me Jesus. The price that nobody could pay. My parents couldn't do that. No one could pay that price for you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Father. Thank you for your love Jesus. Your unending love. I give you glory, Jesus. We give you praises for today. Thank you, Hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We are grateful, Jesus. We are thankful unto you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord for the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. There is power at the cross. You know, without the cross, we won't be here. There won't be any Christianity. Nobody could pay the price at the cross except him, except Jesus. So we are grateful for the cross. There is transformation at the cross. There is salvation at the cross. Healing at the cross. Deliverance at the cross. That's why the cross is so powerful. Thank you, Jesus. The devil made the worst mistake by taking him to that cross. Thank you, Lord. So I just want you to take your seat. We have, we're going to take some testimony tonight. And this testimony could only happen because of the cross. Someone that had an encounter with the power that is involved with the cross. So we are going to take testimony. Do we have Brother Kingsley here tonight? Are you here? Let's just encourage him why, how, why he comes up to share the testimony. What the cross has done in his life. Yes. Let's just give God glory. Thank you. Thank you. Praise him. God bless you, man. Thank you very much, man. Um, good evening, saints. 
uh, tonight, I don't even know where to begin, but praise the Lord. God is good all the time. <clears throat> 25 years ago in America, I gave my life to Christ. I think it's very important that every one of us that is here, we remember the day that we gave our life to Christ. Because if you don't, that means something didn't happen that day. Because that day is so important that you can't forget it. That was July the 27th. In, okay. That was July the 27th in Florida. I gave my life to Christ in uh, 1997. And that day, I, I wept so much. The reason I wept that much was for a long time, I ignored anything about God. And I delved into the world on my own. I left home when I was about 19, going on to, uh, 20. So I left Nigeria very early. That was 1982. And I made a series and host of mistakes on my own. But if I've given my life to Christ earlier on, before I even left Nigeria, I, all the mistakes that I made, I would have averted a lot of them. A lot of them would have been prevented. But after giving my life to Christ, for about three years, I was on fire for Christ. I read the Bible from the back to the, from the beginning to the end, and I was reading everything, learning. Then I went back to Nigeria briefly. Then I started experiencing challenges. I came out of a home where my parents didn't even know who God was. My father believed in, uh, in Nigeria, we call it Juju, uh, which is a, a deity. My mother had a room full of deities, all of them. So they didn't even know who God was. So uh, we, li we lived our life just like that, sacrifices for these deities. And you know when you do that, you actually submit your life to Satan. So my name was invoked, called, hands were laid on me. Needles, uh, pins, blades were used to do all kind of things on us. So we were actually given at that moment to Satan, not to Christ. But thank God for his saving grace. After I gave my life to Christ, these things started wearing off. For 20 odd years, 22 thereabout, I was in Christ going to church regularly. But the thing is this, the power of God that is supposed to be in every one of his children wasn't really in me. Though I knew the word, though I went to church, but I wasn't living in the fullness of Christ. Why did I say this? The reason I said this is this. You can be in Christ and don't even know why you are in Christ. You see, Jesus Christ went on the cross for us on this day. It's called a Good Friday. Okay. His sacrifice wasn't in vain. He didn't just save you for yourself. He saved you so that you can become a conduit of blessing to the world. See, there are so many people perishing out there. And they need you and they need me. But after this pandemic happened, and I, I've been living in the city now for about three years, I prayed. And something happened that night when I prayed. Some, just as pastors might said, he said sometimes you have to get a revelation to know where you are and what you are doing. God just revealed to me that the essence of my life is to actually touch other lives. You see, in my three years in the city, I've watched young men, some commit suicide, some die of overdose. Say about 10 or 12 of them have died in my, that I've witnessed, I've seen. There's a young man that I pass uh, uh, on Capel Street. I always pass this guy. We say hi to each other. About three weeks ago, and I, as I was passing, I saw this picture of this very young man. Some people had a, a cool sense of humor. They placed a beer can next to the picture, and they said, rest in peace. That is one young man uh, that I never spoke to. Though we were friends, I just say hello to him, but I didn't take the extra time to disciple or talk to this man. And he, he hurt my heart when that guy went 
Just like that. So every one of us, a lot of us come to God for different reasons. Some of us believe when we come to God, we, should, we can become wealthy. That's a part of it. Some of us believe when we come to God, now we are holier than everybody. But the reason God has saved every one of us is for us to reach out to a dying world. In your circle of influence, in your place of work, wherever you, school, there are people there that need you. See, you have to become sensitive in the spirit. For the first 22 years that I gave my life to Christ, I will say maybe about 10 lives I prayed for and that they gave their life to Christ. All glory to God. <laughs> Praise God. But after the pandemic, I realized that, and I saw that at the rate people were dying. That anybody could die anytime. So I made a, a, a decision. I said, God, as long as I live, I am going to start reaching out for souls. And I really started doing that. See, in that three years, God has touched uh, almost a hundred and maybe ten lives. And they have given their life to Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All glory to him. But that is just the beginning. You see, giving your life to Christ is the first step. But it goes beyond that. After giving your life to Christ, you have to repent of your sins. I have some young men here, my friends. They are there right now. They gave their life to Christ. But you have to take the next step, Brother Jordan. You have to be dedicated. You have to want to know God. You, you have to turn away from everything that you used to do. I know it's not easy. None of us are saying it's easy, but it's doable. Slowly but surely, God will take you one step after the other towards him. If you yield your vessel to him. So that is what I'm trying to tell everybody this night. It's not just coming to church every Sunday, wearing fancy clothes, and singing great hallelujah. That is very good. To praise God is a, the best thing. But you must be sensitive within you, wherever you walk, in your neighborhood, anywhere you are, to lives that need you. Because you can make a difference. Just It can even be one hour. That, that person can be dead and lost forever. Whereas you can save that life and disciple them for God. Praise the Lord. So tonight, I'm imploring the church to please take it upon yourself. No matter how young you are, you may be 10, 12, as long as you can talk and you can think, please live your life for Christ and touch other lives for him. Because, you see, when you acquire all the wealth in this world and you die, we all know nothing goes with us, right? Your shirt, your cars, your estate, none goes with you. But imagine if God was to reward you for something. What will you reward you for? What? How many lives did you touch? What difference did you make while you were on earth? So we ought to ask ourselves, and every one of us is going to die one day. Because it's appointed to us to die. And then after that, judgment. So it has... God has given us that power to become an agent of reconciliation. So, church, please, wake up. You are not doing it for the pastor. You are not doing it for uh, Pastor Evelyn. You are not doing it for the church. You are doing it for Jesus Christ that you gave your life to. So, if you love Jesus, stand for him. Talk to people. Some may reject you. Don't worry about it. Some may even insult you. Don't worry about it. Imagine what Jesus Christ went through true for me and for you so with humility take whatever comes and don't force it upon anybody but show them love while you are doing this praise the lord thank you very much pastor thank you brother i'm sure this is the most powerful testimony we, we want to hear you know we hear about healing miracles things happening getting cast this is the most powerful testimony when someone has to win souls for the Lord. This afternoon, I was talking with my daughter, Grace. We we're talking about um, the day we will meet the Lord, the reward from the Lord. And when we were talking, and she said, Mom, you, you see, when you see very rich people here on earth, they live all this life, they have this, and sometimes you try to admire them and try to be like them. You say, but you know one thing, we want to do our best so that the day we meet the Lord, we will 
we will have the highest reward from God. And while we were discussing that, the only thing she told me is, was that we need to win souls. Souls winning is the most powerful testimony. Brother, I'm really moved with that. We are all sitting here because somebody spoke to us. Somebody came to us. It's the great commission that the Lord gave to us. So it is good to hear somebody is healed. You have a miracle of provision. Something has happened. But for me, this is the most important testimony. God bless you, brother. So we are here to receive uh, Sister Ellie. She's here with another testimony on what the cross did for her. Let's encourage her as she comes up. Thank you, Sister. God bless you. Praise God. I wasn't prepared, but after hearing about the love of God, I, I, can't, I can't keep this to myself. I got... Uh, I was born in 1946, so you needn't start counting up the years. And I was born again in 1986. And so I had, I had a radical conversion. I just came like a little child to the Lord. And my sister led me to the Lord in my mom's kitchen. My dad was in the hospital fighting cancer. And I was being trained, and I didn't even know it. I was watching her praying with people in the hospital, and I was getting interested. How do you do that, and what's going on, and all this? So I got back to Mom's house. I got saved, and I looked at my sister. I said, I'm still the same. She smiled at me, because I thought something was going to hit me on the head out of heaven. So the next morning, the Lord showed me whether I was the same or not. He started to fill me, overflowed me with this love, this love that's speaking and singing about tonight. I got so concerned, there was so much of this love in me, I didn't know what to do with it. And it was going on and on every day, and it was, of course it was beautiful, but my husband was pulling the rest of his hair out. He didn't know what was wrong with me, he thought I was gone mad. And I, I'd go out of the house full of joy with her, and I'd have to come back in and take the smile off my face, because he was mad at me. He didn't know what happened, he said, I thought I, you had another man, and I thought I did, his name, his name is Jesus. I, but I couldn't tell him that. I couldn't tell him that. Hallelujah. So I've been persecuted from that day to this. I'm still being persecuted. He doesn't talk to me sometimes, but that's okay. I just keep going and flowing and keep going and doing what I have to do. But that's not easy. He doesn't go out with me much anymore, but that's okay because I don't want to go where he goes. And so that pleases me. But anyway, I have been through many places and churches and I've seen miracles and the Lord has used me to see blind eyes open and all that sort of, but as Pastor Evelyn said, to win the loss for Christ is the greatest blessing next to salvation. It's the greatest gift God could give us. So I started, he gave me this radical love for the loss for souls, and everywhere I went, I was after people. Once they were bleeding, I was after them. So I couldn't condense this, I just had to release it and of course, I lost a lot of friends, but I found a big family all over the world. Amen. So um, the years went by, and I was still going on and on, winning the lost. And about 20 years ago, cancer came on my body, and uh, I had the Word of God in me, and I used the Word of God, and I annihilated the cancer with the Word of God. And Jesus healed me of that cancer. And then a few little things throughout the years in the family that were healed people were healed in the house my husband was healed three times in hospital going into the hospital he'd come back again every time there was a death sentence on him he'd come back out again so i know that's the lord anyway and um, many good things i'm still going through lots of stuff that god is going to turn around for good for me but there's no giving up there's no start turning back there's no we, we go all the way with christ but i used to think there was a waiting place because that's what religion taught us that, you know, if you died, that you went to a waiting place. And I used to think, well, Lord, they'll get another chance there. But I, as I read the Bible and realized there's no second chance. You're dead, you're dead. You either go up or you go down. That's why we cannot, we cannot take chances with people. Every time we're near somebody, I have a miracle prayer in my bag. My pockets, my coats, my everything I have is full of miracle prayers. Because they're a great... Uh, draw for people you just say would you like a miracle prayer and in Ireland that goes down very well because it was an old thing people would give you it, they, you'd give them a little leaflet with prayer on it of course it was a religious thing and they'd want to give you money for this but I'd say no Jesus gives freely they want to still give me so but giving the miracle prayer is a thing that draws them to you because they oh I need a miracle I need a miracle 
People are so open. We only have to open our mouth and God will fill it. And we're not to hold back. We, we have something to give everybody. You can be looking in the, in the butcher's window and saying, the price of the meat and the lady could say to you, oh, the meat's gone very dear. We're, it's gone up in price. We're all going up one day. Are you going up? I'd say to her, we're going where? And so you, you use everything, every little thing God gives you to bring the lost to Christ. And God brings so many funny people into your life. Some people tell you they're not even sinners. And you have to try and get around telling them how they are the sinners were born into the world the sinner. Uh, but anyway, and four, four years ago, I ended up in Beaumont Hospital with a brain hemorrhage. And the Lord healed me of that. So in between, I know why God is keeping me alive. Because I'm going after the lost. Otherwise, he might have let me go home. So I'm still here at this age in my life. Still fighting the battles. Still going after the lost. Uh, we have to have a passion. What gave me, really gave me the passion to carry on was when I realized there was no waiting place. There's no in between. It's either heaven or hell. And you're looking at everybody in the street and you're saying, they're the walking dead. We have to get these. We have to go after these people. And we all have something to give them. The love of God. When we give the love of God, that's why God poured his love into us so that we could pour it out into others. Any gifts that God has put in us, they're not ours. They're to give out to the lost. They're to give out to the people, to the world. We own nothing. And I just want to thank God tonight for his reckless love he poured into me. And my beautiful sister that led me to Christ went home to the Lord, and she's up there listening tonight. And God has just used me so many times in different places and different ways. And I give him all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. Oh, such a wonderful thing to have the best husband that is your healer. The best husband that will be your comforter. The best husband that will be your provider, isn't it? When I say husband, some people, some men may feel like, oh, I'm not married. You can still put your husband in the place of wife, you know? When Jesus is your everything, he never leaves you. He's just all that we need. More testimonies are coming up. I know people that did not give their names, they are willing and they are passionate. I just want to take the last testimony so that we can rush straight into the world. Sister Stella, are you ready to come up now? Ready? Okay, let's encourage her. Yeah, God bless you. Yeah, come up. Yeah. Well, I didn't really plan for, for this at all. Uh, so when the, the, yeah, sorry, she, he was talking about the, the, uh, the preaching, uh, winning soul for Christ, you know. And something just touched me because I have shared this testimony for some of my friends and uh, it really blessed them. You know, we are in a place whereby you are not allowed to do this, you are not allowed to do that. That kind of holds you back even when you want to do it sometime. You are thinking of what might happen, you know, so it's actually my workplace, you know, and God has helped me to minister to few people that actually that the Holy Spirit will kind of minister to me like talk to that person. So this particular word I want to share is was a, the word for the cancer, people that has the cancer, you know. So I met a man there that I was looking after and he was sober for what he did. He felt that he doesn't have no time for him to repent because he's dying. Then I was like, what exactly are you regretting that you, if you have a second chance, you might want to do it better? He started telling me stuff. Then right there, I know this is not allowed, but I felt that the Holy Spirit, how can I ignore this? You know, I have seen people die whereby I could be the person that gave that person the last food before he, he died. And I was like, God, so I am here. I just allow this person to die. Sometimes, actually, you want to pray with some people. They were like, oh, no, I don't believe in God. Don't worry. And you felt so terrible. Like, why? So this particular man, I went to him. I said, you know what? 
You know, all these things you are talking about, they can be forgiven if only you have said Christ. And he was like, I am a Catholic. I'm like, you are a Catholic. Do you believe in Jesus? He said, yeah, I used to. I used to, you know, he is not really sure if he's still or not. You know, I'm like, let me lead you to lead you to Christ. Then we say a prayer. And in my heart, I pray. I say, God, talk to this man tonight. So luckily for me, before I left home the next day, I said, God, I want to meet that man again. Let them send me back to that place. So when I got to work, they sent me back to that place. And right now, when I, when I finish that morning time, the Holy Spirit was ministering to me. And I felt I have to go and buy a Bible. So when I go to the city, I, I order for a lot of New Testament. You know, and I'm now saying, how can I give this thing to this man now that I will not get into trouble? And I felt that voice keep telling me, go ahead, go ahead. I own this place. Go ahead. I own this place. I called my husband, my husband like, oh, be careful. Be careful. And now I am shaking. And I said, God, I want you to prove yourself to this man. I went, I bought the Bible. So immediately I get there, they want to transfer me to somewhere else. Then I begin to like, God is doing something. So God actually brought me here so that I can give this man this thing. Then I go to where I want to go. Then how to put it there now is another thing. So I try my best to put it somewhere. So when I came back the next day, he told me, Jesus was calling me all night. I couldn't sleep. This man came to me. He was calling me all night. Immediately, I knew that man was healed. As I'm talking to you now, he's been discharged. And when I gave him that Bible, and this, the third day, I, I pray, pray again. I said, God, let them send me back to that place again. Lo and behold, they sent me back there again. Then when I came, I peep because I, I left the Bible inside the book he was reading. It was a tiny uh, New Testament. I left it there. When I came, I saw him reading it. I was like, Jesus! I saw him reading it. Then, I again, they transferred me back to another place. And I was like, so he's reading it. I was crying. The joy in my heart. My heart want to burst. The joy in my heart. So I didn't see this man for three weeks. I didn't see him. So one day, and they, they sent me to another place. I went to, as I was taking care of them, I actually went to this man's room. We finished taking care of this man. I went back to sit down. As I was sitting down, the Holy Spirit is saying, don't you remember that man? was like wish man wish man wish man it took me some time then i went to the uh, my colleague what's the name of that man he tell me the surname and everything i was like then i rushed back when i rushed back i saw that he has finished the new testament and then i asked him what did you what, what happened he told me um, the look was very 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 specific i love the book of luke and i said anyone you don't understand Tell God to interpret it to, it to you. Tell the Holy Spirit to interpret it to you. Was I, you're going to give me your name. Do you know I will be discharged tomorrow? I am healed. I am healed. He told me he's going to tell his partner what God has done for him. And this is not all. And God has used me in so many ways like that. Even when I go to psychiatric uh, side, God has used me to help a whole lot of people. But for me to be able to give them Mm -hmm, you know, so I am grateful to God that that man is he, God has shown his power, hallelujah thank you so much thank you, God bless you man thank you, Glory be to you. God bless you thank you so much uh, God is so good isn't he, we can't I don't see my mouth, we can't see this mouth, 
We have to use it with wisdom. You understand? There are places we go that God has just opened that door for us to win somebody, to pray for somebody, so that God can save that person. Thank you, sister, for obeying the Holy Spirit. We have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Amen? So are we ready for the word tonight? Yes, we have a special guest from Solid Rock tonight. I want you to open up your heart. So, I want you to open up your heart, get ready to receive every word that God is going to use this special guest tonight to bring to us. And uh, we are going to welcome Brother Kevin. Can you come to the front? Let's appreciate Brother Kevin as he comes to the front tonight. So, you, you know, one thing I love about this brother is his willingness. He's always willing. The first time when I met them, when I talked with this brother on the phone, I always confused his voice with his wife. I'm like, this is the wife of the brother. Because he's so gentle, such a gentle brother. So we are trusting God tonight that the Lord will use you and speak to us. Please, let's really, really encourage him and receive every word that God has for us tonight. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank Jesus for his love. Uh, first thing first, I just want to uh, thank Pastor Myth and Pastor Evelyn for the encouragement, for the help, for the support. These are my parents. <laughs> These are my parents. Amen. Amen. And I'm also very privileged to be... Um, among the first to open this conference. Amen. <laughs> it means a lot. We thank God for that. And, and um, we know that Easter is very, very important for us um, believers because um, our faith, our, uh, all of our faith is based on the cross of Jesus and the empty tomb. It's based on that. The reason why we are here together is because of the cross. And I believe, uh, I remember um, Pastor was uh, in the past was preaching and he and was saying the cross unites all of us different nationality different countries diff all of it you know the cross brings us all together and we thank Jesus for such a tremendous sacrifice amen before we begin I just want to pray Holy Spirit I pray that you think through my mind speak through my mouth Move through my hands and all over my body. And that you use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The verse that I want us to look is the verse that uh, the sister mentioned. A very, a very, uh, the favorite verse of the man that she was ministering to. Which is, the, which is in the book of Luke 23, verse 39 to 43. I have an NLT version here. So I will read. It says, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you are the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. And us too. While you're at it. But the other uh, criminal protested. Don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die. We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. 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 Today, I want to talk to us about the cross, the symbol of hope. The cross, the symbol of hope. The cross is the symbol of hope because an innocent man, Jesus Christ, died on the cross so that all the guilty may walk free. Amen. Amen. The cross is the place of transaction where Jesus switches his place with whoever will believe him. Okay. Jesus is ready for whoever accepts him so that 
that person does not go on the cross. So that person does not die. Before Jesus was condemned as a criminal and taken uh, to the cross, a real criminal was released. We know that story very well. Barnabas was released and Jesus was condemned. Everybody was shouting, crucify him, crucify the innocent. While the criminal, the real criminal walked out free. You see, the cross was a pagan invention. Uh, and uh, obviously, God cannot create such a thing. Uh, um, a Christian cannot create such a thing. So it was a pagan invention. And we see a force in the book of, of Genesis 40, uh, verse 19. I'm just quoting this in passing. When Joseph told uh, one of the men that was in prison, he to, uh, the cup bearer, he told him uh, that uh, within three days, he will be impaled on the cross. That's what we see on the pole. That's what we see at first. This invention was not uh, for enjoyment. It was not something. It, it was not something good. I hear people nowadays. They will say, uh, "I'm going to hell. Hell is a, such a wonderful place. I'm going to have a party there." Who told you? They think that when, as, as soon as they reach there, that there's going to be a dance floor, a DJ that's ready, that's playing their best tune for them to dance on. That's not what's going to happen there. The cross was an instrument of death. It was a place of extreme pain. Nobody, uh, uh, nobody hung on the cross had hope. Nobody, nobody was hung on the cross had hope. Because when you were hung on the cross, it's either that uh, you, you lost all hope. There's no way of you coming down of that place. And if, and if by any chance you get to come out of that place, there's either two things that's going to happen to you. You may never walk for life. Or you may have problems with your knees forever. Because you remember when Jesus was crucified, they wanted to come and break the knees of all those who were crucified. And so whoever was crucified on the cross cannot live to tell. They either die or they become a cripple for life. And that makes them a beggar than a person who is not able to provide for himself. Amen? Are you still with me? What I'm trying to say is this. Anyone who sins... And fall short of the glory of God cannot have a normal life. You cannot have a normal life. You may not know what that life was like or what the, the good life or the life before the fall was like. But once a person falls into sin, can no longer have a normal life. Before you say, oh no, this doesn't concern me. I'm not into that category. That doesn't matter. Let me, let me show you something here. On the day Jesus was crucified... Uh, which is 2,000 years ago and this day. There was two thieves um, that was hung on the cross beside him, one on his left hand, one on his right hand. And in relation to the thieves, the Bible has a lot to say. The Bible says that if you break one commandment, you're guilty of, of them all. Okay? So before you were saved, you were a thief. Do you believe that? Okay. I like your honesty. A thief is a criminal. A criminal is a lawbreaker. A law is the rule that a, an authority gives for everyone to abide by. And in this case, we are talking about God, the supreme authority and lawgiver. The seventh commandment says, you shall not steal. So if you break one commandment, you're guilty of them all. So if you were, you cuss or you did something else, just know that you broke all of them. So you may say, oh no, I never stole before. But if you broke another commandment, that makes you also a, a, a thief. I, I, I watch a lot of uh, evangelists on television. They will go and preach. They will go and share the gospel. And they will say, uh, they, they will tell the people, um, have you ever broken a commandment before? And everybody will try, will, 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 will try to defend themselves. Like, no, I'm a good person. I don't kill. I don't do this. I don't do that. But they forget the fact that if you break one command, you're guilty of them all. So it doesn't matter which one you broke. It doesn't matter which one you broke. So you're not a good person because you did not kill. You're not a good person because you don't hate other people. It doesn't make you a good person. 
it doesn't make you a good person. So most people will say that, forgetting that um, they have broken, if they have broken one command, they are guilty of also the seventh command, commandment, which says, you shall not steal. Amen? There's some stuff that I found in the Bible that was very, very interesting. Uh, concerning uh, the Bible, uh, concerning the thief, um, the Bible says you are guilty. Guilty means that there's a sentence against you that condemns you. When you go to the court of law and they say you are guilty, it means that they have read the files, they have examined your story, and they say you are guilty. They pronounce you guilty. So a thief is, first of all, guilty. If you stand before God, God is not going to say, oh, no, uh, you know, that was one time. No, God is going to say you are guilty. You broke the seventh command. You are guilty. And, and the guilty conscience is not a free conscience. Do you know that a guilty conscience is not a free conscience? Imagine you're walking around with something in your mind. It's just bothering you. Uh, like, uh, I remember that bread that I stole five years ago. For that long time. You, you, you're, you're not free. You're not at peace. You have that guilty conscience. And that, and, and, and that is an indication. That is a command that was broken. Many people are trying to brush it aside. But that, is a, but, but, but that is an indication. A thief has no peace. There is no peace for a thief. You cannot have peace. I see. I, I watch a lot of movies. right? So movies have taught me a lot of things. And uh, it shows that when when a person steals, they don't sleep. They sleep with one eye open. <laughs> they don't sleep. They're watching two things. One is for them to not be, be get caught. The second one is also not another thief to come and steal after them. They, 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 they're, they're restless. So a thief or a lawbreaker has no peace, really. Because they, they can't even sleep at night. They can't even relax. Me, when I go to bed, I snore. I sleep. I relax. I don't have a problem with anybody. I relax. And I know it's, it's the case for many of you. You relax. You sleep. You don't have a problem with anyone. But a, but a thief has no peace. He's restless. He has to watch his back at all times. He has to look around. Wherever he goes, he, he has to be mindful of the area that he goes. But we just walk around and let the Holy Spirit protect us. Hey? <laughs> A thief in Exodus 22, verse 2. Exodus 22, verse 2, it says that if a thief receives a fatal blow, the blood or the defender is not guilty of his bloodshed. That's the whole verse there. Is if a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who kills the thief is not guilty of murder. When you're a thief, nobody cares. Nobody cares what happens to you. Nobody cares if you, if you die. And I know that a lot of times people will, 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 will encourage people into sin. They encourage into, into nonsense. But guess what? Nobody's going to stand with you at the judgment. The thief, won't, the, other, the, the person that's encouraging you won't stand with you. In fact, they will, they will also be waiting for their own judgment. <laughs> They'll be busy trying to defend themselves. Amen. Many people will applaud you when you're doing wrong. And, and, and we, know, we know all kinds of, there's all kinds of things happening in the world, in the world now. People are, pe people are all passive. They're all, we love you, we're okay with you, do whatever you want. That's all good, that's all good. But in the day of judgment, they won't stand there with you. Because they will be busy trying to figure out their own life. So a thief who receives a fatal blow, the bloodshed is on their own hands. And that, that is to say, a person who sins, who breaks the law, if they are to die, their blood is in their own hands. Because they are falling short of the glory of God, as the Bible says. Let me show you another one. Exodus 22, verse 1. It says, a thief must pay five times. Uh, more for each oxen. Whoever steals an oxen, uh, an ox or a sheep, and then kills or sells it, the thief must pay back five, five oxen for each oxen stolen. 
and four sheep for each sheep stolen. I did the math. I was thinking about it. Imagine I steal 100 euro and I have to pay back 200 euro. What have I gained in the end? You know, what have I gained in the end? And the Bible says, for what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world than to lose his soul? So you going around amassing treasures as in Candy Crush. You know Candy Crush? You're there amassing treasures. You're there going left and right, getting this and getting that. Yet you haven't given your life to Christ. In the end, you end up empty-handed because you can't keep anything. All the effort that you have done, all the amassing that you have done, all the going from place to place. In the end, you have nothing. You have nothing to show for. You gain nothing. You gain nothing. A thief has to pay in in. It, this one says he has to pay five times. He has to pay double in Exodus 22 verse 7. 22 verse 7. He has to pay double for why he stole. It says, suppose someone leaves money or good with the neighbor for safekeeping and they're stolen from the neighbor's house. If the thief is caught, the, compensa the compensation is double the value of what was stolen. Again, I did my math, and, and I came short again, and I didn't like the outcome. That if you steal something, you have to pay double. A hundred euro, you pay back at 200 euro. It doesn't make sense. First of all, you stole the hundred euro, you may have nothing in your pocket, and you have to pay back 200. It's a lot. It's not a good math. It's not a good path. It's not a good path. Exodus 22, uh, 22 verse 2 says, if a thief is caught, he must pay in full. If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and is killed, that's a different one. That's 22-2. That's it is 22-2. I guess that was probably 22-7. But a thief has to pay in full. A thief has to pay in full. A person who sins, who breaks the law, have to pay in full. That's why the Bible again says that the wage of sin is death. You will pay in full, not a single day short. You will pay everything. One day when somebody asked me, was like, uh, how come when you do something wrong, you have to, um, you know, uh, you have to pay double or, or even when God, when he's judging people, he give you a life uh, in separation. I was like, have you ever seen a judge, uh, when you do something wrong, he say, no, you just do five years and that's it. He give you whatever he wants to give you. Even if the thing can be nine months, if he says three years, you do three years. You pay in full. You pay double. You pay more. The, the, the goal is not for you to do those things. The goal is for you to stay away from those things. It's for you to stay away from those things. The thief feels shame or a lawbreaker feels shame when you are caught. Jeremiah 22, uh, Jeremiah 2 verse 26. When a thief is placed on the cross, he feels shame. As a thief is disgraced when he's caught. A thief is disgraced when he's caught. I know many people, they live like, um, I'm not disgraced, I'm not shame, I don't care, I, 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 I don't care what happened and so on. You will feel shame. There is a day where you will feel shame. When the law is being read against you, is you're being told of the things, of the crime, of the things that you have done, you will feel the shame. And, and, and we know from the story of, of the thief when they were placed on the cross, people were walking by and they were shaking their head in shame and disgrace of those people that was hung on the cross. Your mom and your dad is seeing you and they're just shaking their head and saying, I don't know this child. I don't know what happened to this. You were a disgrace for the whole city to see. Your neighbor and your friends, they get to look at you in that state. You are placed publicly for all to see. Many people live in a state of shame. I, I believe sometimes being feeling shame is an indication of the law of God being broken. I remember in the past, I, I did something wrong and I felt shame for it. When I came before God, I felt shame. I was like, God, 
this is not right. <laughs> I remember what I did. I have it in my mind. I remember it. I felt shame. There are people who walk around like that every day. They just feel shame. They just, they're just ashamed of themselves, ashamed of the act of the past, ashamed of something that they have done years ago. They feel that shame. That is an indication. The law of God has been broken. Something is wrong. That's why you feel that way. That's why you feel that way. I have two more. Um, a thief is banished. That is Zechariah 5 verse 3. A thief is banished. Must be banished. And they said to me, this is the curse that, that is going out over the whole land. For according to what it says, no one, no, one uh, on one side, Every thief will be banished. That's why I want to stop. Every thief will be banished. Have you ever seen a criminal rent a house or an apartment or a place beside the police station? <laughs> you, you don't see them. It doesn't happen. If, if they know what they are doing, they will be very, very far. I'm waiting for the day that I'll see a drug dealer, a gangster, who has an apartment right beside the guard station and so proudly being there. You won't see that. It's rare. Why? Not because they want to be, not because the guard is telling them to be away from me. No, because of themselves. They banish themselves because of the act that they are doing. And that's the same thing we do. When we are wrong, we run away from God. We don't want to be in his presence. And the Bible in, 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 in Genesis 3 he, he speaks about Adam and Eve. He says that after Adam and Eve sinned against God, they were banished from the Garden of Eden. They were banished from, 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 from the presence of God. They were banished from this place that was wonderfully created for them, for para from, from paradise. That's where they were banished from. And they left that place with shame. Who, who, who kicked them out? It wasn't, it wasn't God. The sin kicked them out. It was their lifestyle that kicked them out. Because God is welcome. <laughs> God wants to be with all of us. But our sins pushes us away from him. Last one. A thief is under the curse. Or some people will say under the curse. Whichever version you want. <laughs> Whichever version you want. In Galatians 3, 13, it says, Galatians 3, 13, it says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse of, from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse of, for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scripture, curse is everyone who is hung on the tree. So, just to walk this back. If you have broken the law, you are as good as the thief on the cross, which means you are under curse. But this is what Christ has done. That is what Christ has done. The sinner is under curse. And it doesn't matter if your life is booming, your business is great, you are going places, you can be traveling all over the world yet being under curse. You can be traveling all over the world but yet being in bondage. You can be doing all kinds of things and people saying, oh, you're very successful in life, but yet you're under curse. Yet you're not free. Even if your affairs in every, in every direction is going fine, you are still under curse. There is a difference between a person who is in Christ and a person who is living life the way, the, 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 way, the way they please. I know that I said the message, it is the cross, a sign of hope. And I want to tell you how that hope comes about. I want to tell you how that hope comes about. You see, there was two thieves that was hung on the cross beside Jesus. And if you read in Matthew 27, verse 44, 
those two T's, they were both insulting Christ. It wasn't just one of them. Both of them were against him. Both of them was mocking Jesus. Both of them. But it's one of them who had a change of heart. One of them who realized that this man who was on the cross is dying for not committing any sin. He was an innocent man. While we deserve to be here. While we deserve to be here. When we read in, in, in Luke 23, verse 40, uh, 29, verse 40, 43, is where the man says, is uh, verse 42, I believe, is where the man says, we are criminals, but not this man. We are the wrongdoers. We are the one who broke the law, but not this man. But why does he have to die? Why does he have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus had to die so that those on the cross may walk free. Jesus had to die so that a drug dealer may walk free. Jesus had to die so that a drug addict may walk free. Jesus had to die so that those who are struggling mentally can walk free. For those who are in bondage of some sort may walk free. That's why Jesus had to die. Jesus is the hope. The cross stands as a hope. Whenever you see the cross of Jesus, tell yourself there is hope. There is hope. There is hope. Because of the cross, there is hope. Because of it, there is hope. There is two things that one of the men did on the cross. He started bad. He started the same as everyone else. He was, he was mocking Jesus, but it didn't end in the same page. It didn't end in the same way. It didn't end in the same way. And I don't know who needs to hear this. You may be watching online and you may be thinking to yourself, maybe the time is gone for me. You heard the testimonies. Maybe the time is gone for me. No, the time is not gone. The cross of Christ still stands. And whoever will put their trust in Jesus will be saved. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of God. This thief, he did a very smart thing. Even though he was wrong at first, he said, I am the one who's guilty, not Jesus. He recognized his sins. He recognized his wrong and he repented. That's the first step. You have to repent. You have to acknowledge the wrong that you have done. You have to acknowledge your sins. You have, you have to acknowledge that you went astray. That you've broken God's command. And according to God's word, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wage of sin is death. It's not, nothing else. The Bible also says that you cannot expect to sow in sin and reap in righteousness. It's not possible. You cannot expect to, to, to plant apple and, and receive banana. Have you ever seen it? I've never seen it. If you see it, please send me a picture. I've never seen it. This man, he took a very, a very radical decision. Because he understood something. That when he will stand before Christ, when he will stand before God, that he, whether his neighbor is there or not, that's not his problem. That's not his concern. And Brother Kingsley quoted a passage there. He said he's appointed to man to, to, to die once and then come judgment. Judgment is coming for every man. It's coming for every man. Different than others, yes. Some will be judged based on the life that they have lived. I believe we will be rewarded. And if you want to be in the same category, this is the step that you have to take. Start by confessing your sins. Start by repenting. And repentance is going completely different route. Repentance is, is saying, God, I stop. I stop doing this. Because one moment I'm mocking God, but now I stop. The Bible says people mock things that they do not understand. When we go to evangelize, this is what we see. You, you present people Jesus and they say, go away with your Jesus. I don't need your Jesus. Jesus is the only way for you. Jesus is the only solution. Jesus is the only answer to a broken world. There's nobody else. There's nobody else. There's, there may be many religions out there. But there's only one empty tomb. There's only one empty tomb. And the second thing that man did is believe. He believed in Christ. He believed in Jesus. First he repented. First he walked away from his old life. First, he, ad he admit his, his wrong. But second thing he did, he believed. He believed in Jesus. He believed that he's the son of God. He believed that he's the Messiah. That's why he was able to alter this word and say, when you remember me when you come in your kingdom. 
That is somebody who believes. Because if you don't believe, you, don't, you wouldn't believe that Jesus has a kingdom. Because the sign that they put atop, on top of Jesus' head, it was a mockery, not a truth. It was a, these people, they were mocking Jesus. They said, let's put on top of his, of his cross the king of the Jews. It wasn't the truth. They were mocking him. He believed in the Son of God. And that's what you have to do. Believe in the Son of God. The Bible says, blessed is he who believes without seeing. Believe in Christ. That 2,000 years ago, he walked this earth. And he was crucified on the same cross. That maybe you were mocking before. That maybe you were not taking serious. That maybe you were not taking serious. I like what Ellie said. Ellie is after you. If you're alive, she's after you. <laughs> she's after you. If you have breath of life, she's after you. And that I believe also. As long as you have breath of life, you have a chance. You have a chance. This man, the thieves, they were not walking about. They were crucified. They were on the cross. Where it seemed like there was no hope anymore. Where it seemed like there were no way. There was no way out. You may be feeling like that. There's no way out. And I'm not just talking about salvation. You might be thinking even that, oh, in this situation, there's no way out. Christ bought it. Christ bought it. He bought your healing. He bought it. He bought it all. He bought your deliverance, your freedom. He bought it. He bought it. Believe in the Son of God. Believe in the Son of God and you will be saved. That is the, that is the message of the cross. It is a message of hope. It is a message of hope. Whatever you, whoever you might be, wherever you might be in this world, you might be, you might be thinking, oh, I am 60 years old. There is no longer time for me. Or I am only a young child. I'm only a little person. No, there is still, there is time for you. Whatever the category, whatever category you may identify in, there is still all for you. There's still all for you. Jesus is for the young and is for the old. And everything in between. Everything in between. Sometimes people look at us and they say, why are you always happy? Why are you always smiling? Why are you always joyful? I met Christ. I met him. And if you meet him for yourself, you will realize this will also become your reality. This will also become your reality. I gave my life to Christ personally, walked with God in 2011 where I was going through a situation where it felt like chaos. One moment I was homeless, the next moment I was, I was, uh, I, I lost a dear person. I lost my mom at that, at that time. And I was thinking, this is too much. This is too much. And at the same time, I'm like, I'm failing in life also. So you have these arrows coming from every angle. And all I was thinking, the only way I sat down, I remember I sat down, uh, it, near the traffic light and the sky was coming by I kept thinking in my head maybe I could jump I saw this is probably the way out this is the way out there's no way out that's not the way out and that very moment have you ever felt Jesus wiping away your tears the love of God is real that is why the Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his one be only begotten son, Jesus. The reason for the cross, it is an evidence of God's love. It is a proof that God loves you, whoever you may be. And if you want to give your life to Christ, you want to make it right with God. You want to fix your life. God's arms are open, wide open. In fact, he's rooting for you. He's saying, say yes to my promise. Say yes to my gift. Say yes to, to, to Jesus, whom I sent for you. Say yes to it. Say yes to him. And see how I will radically transform your life. I look for us to pray. If you want to make your life right with Christ, this is the moment. And if you want to give your life to Christ, this is also the moment. There's no perfect day than this. 
This is the very day that Jesus was, was, was carried to the cross. The day that the devil made the biggest mistake of his life. The day of his lost. And even you who is watching online. Christ is in your room. He's in your house. He's at the very place where you find yourself. David said, why can I run away from your presence? Make your right with God today. Put your life in order with Christ today. Dedicate your life to God today. You heard the testimonies. What Christ has done for each and every one of the, the people who gave the testimony can do it for you too. Let's say this prayer. Christ Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you came to earth. And you died for my sins. The Bible is true. You are true. And today, I choose to commit my life in your hands. Forgive me my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Today, I believe I'm accepted into your kingdom. From this day forward, I want to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have said a prayer for the first time, you are a Jesus crazy like the rest of us. Welcome to the club. May God bless you all. One, two. Let's give glory to God. Let's, let's, go, let's clap our hands again. We give glory to God for that word. Kev, man, that blessed me, bro. Real talk. Um, we've reached that point in the service where I come to take your money. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm not, I'm not taking your money. Um, but <laughs> honestly speaking, when, when Kev uh, texted me and he was like, Phil, you're going to do the offering tonight. I was just I don't even know what to say. Um, because you got two parks of people. One, one group of people, they think that, oh, what's the point on giving to the gospel? You're just trying to steal my money, fund your planes, fund your cars, and all the usual jargon. And then there's the other group of people who will give everything that they have. And they're more than open to pour out their heart. So... I'm going to pitch it to you this way. If you, could, if you ever want to discern the way, I, the way God is speaking to me, just listen to what I'm playing. That's, that's the easiest way to just listen. And the song that was just like singing through my spirit as, um, as Kevin was, was delivering that message about like, you know, we in fact were the thieves who actually stole from God. Um, and it was a price that we could not pay, right? And the song that was going through my spirit was, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, right? Crimson had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. 
right? And it's that first line that got me, is that Jesus paid it all, right? So now, listening, thinking about that song, that's a song that my mom used to always play in the kitchen when I get back from, from school. That's what she would be playing. That's what she'd be singing continuously. And looking back at it now, I'm just like, huh. I think about it more and more, and it challenges me when it comes to what I actually give to God, right? Like, one of the things that, um, you know, is, is quite prevalent for us as believers is how God doesn't just want, you know, you, not just what you have or what you can give him, but he wants you. He wants all of you. He wants your heart, right? And best believe that everything that he has ever created, everything that he has even put into your possession, whether you choose to acknowledge him or not, it's his. He owns it all. And he has the right, he has every single ounce of power to take it away from you straight away, right? I think about, you know, the fact that it was God who has, unbeknownst to me, been sustaining my parents, who has been who have now been able to like get me through school, get me through uni and all this type of stuff. And where I'm at today, the clothes that are on my back, the shoes on my feet, is because of what he's continuously providing behind the scenes. And I could never know what could be coming for me. I could never know what could, what could take me out. I could walk out of this building, God forbid, knock on wood, uh, and, get hit, and get hit by a bus. Who knows what could happen to me? But it's just to say that for you, where you are right now, think of everything that you have, everything that you own. Whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, it was him ultimately who, yes, he paid the ultimate price, but everything that you have is his. And we owe it back to him because he paid a price that we could never pay. Amen. And... Well, I challenge you, whether you, you know, you do the one-tenth thing or the tithing or whatever, I, I don't care really, like, how much you decide to put down. That's between you and the Father. But really look deep into your heart and ask yourself, is my giving unto him today coming from a place of, yo, you're a genie in a bottle and I want this, I want that, I want that. Or is it coming from a place of, you know what, God, you blessed me with this. Everything that I have, you, 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 tr you gave it to me and you trusted me with it. And out of honor to you, I'm going to give it back. Because I know you are more than capable of providing more and providing for not just my needs. If he can provide himself as a sacrifice to wash away your sins, what more can he provide for you every single day? So I want to ask you, uh, as I said, I'm not, I, I, even, I ain't even really spoken about money, to be honest. I'm just asking you for yourself and how God has poured himself out. Like, just think about this weekend, how he gave himself in human form and he was innocent. It was us who, who'd actually deserved to be strung upon a tree and killed but yet he still gave himself, he decided to suffer and everything more and pay an, un, an unpayable debt that we, we, we would be working forever to try and pay it off, but we never would be able to. So with that, I encourage you, give freely, but give knowing the sacrifice that he actually paid for you today. Amen. Thank you, Phil. Okay. He said we should give. So can we give? Okay, let's give now. Amen. So if you're giving straight into the church account, go ahead and do that. If you're a cash giver, ushers will go around and they receive your offering. Give to the Lord. Amen. Come on, talk back to me. Amen. 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 Are you blessed tonight? Are you blessed tonight? Are you blessed tonight? Are you blessed tonight? Thank you, uh, Kevin, for the word that you brought. 
powerful word. Powerful word. Blessed word. I pray that the word has gone out and that we have received it in Jesus name. What about the testimonies we had tonight? Really, really beautiful. Beautiful to, I mean, every, you see, every life is, today we celebrate the cross, right? Celebrate what Jesus did on the cross. And do you understand that for all of us that are in this room right now, it's because of the cross of Jesus? It's because of the cross power of the cross and what a message about the cross it could have been your cross 